Botswana and global diamond giant De Beers have approved a $1 billion investment to dig, uh, to dig under the world's richest diamond mine. The Botswana Diamond Company's board said it has given the go-ahead to works that are to extend the life of the Juaneng mine, turning it from an open pit site to an underground operation. The French news agency, AFP, says the mine accounts for about 70% of profits from Debswana. It's a 50-50 joint venture between the government and the beers, which auctions most of the gemstones. The firm says the move, which comes amid a global drop in demand for the precious gems, will extend its lifespan by 20 years and yield up to 9 million carats per year. One California valley grows a large percentage of the vegetables in the U.S., but it depends entirely on the shrinking Colorado River for water. Matt Debo has this third story in our five-part series, Rivers at Risk. This canal sends water to California's Imperial Valley. It's where the largest share of Colorado River water gets used for growing crops in an area that otherwise would be a desert. Water rights for the valley are held by the Imperial Irrigation District, which has allocated about 3 million acre feet of water per year, more than the states of Arizona and Nevada combined. It has senior water rights according to the 100-year-old Colorado Compact Agreement, making it the last user required to take cuts in the event of a shortage. Tina Shields is a water manager for the Imperial Irrigation District. We're big in the winter vegetables. Um, if you're eating lettuce in December, it's probably coming from here or the Yuma Valleys. The irrigation district supplies water to over 200,000 hectares, which in 2022 produced $2.6 billion worth of crops and livestock. It's a system that has worked for decades when reservoirs were full. Now we're at some of these critical elevations, which we would love to ignore and just say we have senior water rights, um, but it turns out it's our only water supply. With the Colorado River system threatened, the district agreed in May 2023 to reduce the water it provides farmers by about 25 percent for the next three years in return for federal funds. Stephen Hawk is a fourth generation farmer in the valley. There are going to have to be cuts and it will affect how we farm here. You know, I try to be as judicious as I can with the water that I'm given. I know it's, it's a very important resource. I don't want to waste a drop. For over a decade, the agency has been helping farmers fund the expense of transitioning to more water-efficient irrigation systems, like sprinklers and drip. The program is paid for with water sales to cities. Sprinklers are helping conserve water, but critics say water is being wasted on crops that humans don't eat. More than half of the fields here grow alfalfa and other grasses used to feed livestock. They are lucrative crops grown year-round in the valley but they also consume the most water. While it could be a little bit controversial, it also has given us sustainability. Our margins on a lot of the crops that we grow are so razor thin, it's very easy. I know a lot of people that have gone uh, under. Hawk now grows more vegetables and less alfalfa than he used to, but he doubts that he could find buyers if he replaced all his alfalfa fields with produce. We only grow what the demand is for. So if people want to eat hamburgers, and have milkshakes, uh, then we've got to produce enough alfalfa and forage to feed the, the cows. The most drastic adaptation would be taking fields out of production completely. That is not supported by the irrigation district management. It's not good for our community. It causes additional unemployment and third-party impacts on all those farm-related businesses. Instead, Shield says they are considering cutting off water to crops such as alfalfa for a few months of the year. As this farming community waits to see how it will be affected by falling water levels, Hawk hopes his farm will survive to pass on to the next generation. Matt Dibble, VOA News, Holtzville, California. A U.S.-based nonprofit is working with the government of Rwanda to provide free surgical care to women who are suffering from the obstetric uh, fistula restoring not only their health, but also their dignity. VOA's Julie Tabo has more. It's a joyous occasion for these Rwandan women on this rainy day in the capital, Kigali. 
They are welcoming a U.S. team here to help women suffering from obstetric fistula and other gynecological issues. One of those women is Julianne Nirondinabo, who became incontinent after her bladder was damaged during childbirth. Fistula caused me depression. I couldn't earn money or perform physical tasks. I even struggled to care for my child, depending on my husband for our needs. An obstetric fistula is a hole that can form between the mother's birth canal and her bladder or rectum during prolonged or obstructed labor or a badly performed cesarean section. This devastating injury can cause a woman to continuously leak urine, feces, or both. It can cause her great pain and emit a strong odor that often leads to feelings of shame and social isolation. Nirandi Nabo's fistula was repaired by an all-volunteer surgical team assembled by the U.S. nonprofit International Organization for Women and Development. But not all fistula victims are so lucky. More than two million women live with untreated obstetric fistula in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, according to the World Health Organization. Barbara Margolis is founder and executive director of the organization. When you have fistula, trust me, it is one of the worst situations a woman could possibly have. She's treated like she has leprosy. No one wants to be near her. She smells all the time. Her children don't want to be near her. Her husband sometimes can even leave. So we're here to fix that. The team visits Rwanda three times a year and works closely with the government, which has been providing assistance and medical students for training since 2010. Medical student Christy Marie Bibian Ruamo has been part of the fistula repair program since 2022. Fistula patients uh, come in a vulnerable state. After their surgeries, they are smiling, grateful, and they are excited to, to go home. How are you? Fine, fine. Improving women's health impacts not only them, but also their families and communities. A Kenyan court warned prosecutors Tuesday it will release under its own terms a pastor and others accused of being behind the death of 429 people believed to be his cult followers if they aren't charged within two weeks. For months since the arrests last April, prosecutors have asked the court for permission to keep holding Paul McKenzie and 28 others while they look into the case that shocked Kenyans with the discovery of mass graves and allegations of starvation and strangulation. But Shanzu Senior Principal Magistrate Yusufu Shikander noted that the suspects had been detained for 117 days since the last application for an extension and it was enough time to have completed investigations. The defense has urged that the constitutional right for bail for Mackenzie and others were being violated since they haven't been charged. The magistrate said the suspects had been detained without trial for longer than anyone in Kenya since the adoption of the country's 2010 constitution that outlawed detention without trial. Mackenzie is serving a separate one-year prison sentence after being found guilty of operating a film studio and producing films without a valid license. The court case emerged when police rescued 15 emaciated people from Mackenzie's church in Kilfi County in Kenya's southeast. Four died after the group was taken to a hospital. Survivors told investigators the pastor had instructed them to fast to death before the world ends so they could meet Jesus. A search of the remote forested area has found 429 bodies and dozens of mass graves. Authorities have said autopsies on some bodies showed starvation, strangulation or suffocation. <laughs>